and welcome to the official launch of the Global Talent Trends Study 2021. My name is Catalina Pia and I'm one of the principal consultants here at Mercer Career in Australia. And I'm delighted to be joined by two of my colleagues, Kate Whitehead and Ephraim Patrick, to really share with you the high level results and the high level insights of our survey for this year. For those of you that haven't been able to come on the journey with us from the start, a bit of a recap. Um, as you may know, Mercer has been going on this journey of really trying to understand what are the emerging trends that we are seeing um, globally across geographies, across interest, industries that are really starting to shape the talent agenda and the workforce more globally. And in order to do that, we've really gone out to executives, board members, HR leaders with a range of questions covering career, health and wealth issues to really understand where they want to focus their attention and what are some of the challenges that they want to solve for in terms of their workforce. And we've done that for five, six years now. But given, of course, the uh, pandemic last year, we wanted to take a bit of a different focus. And so in October 2020, we wanted to move from doing a global focus to really localize our focus and understanding how has the pandemic impacted how, work, how organizations are going to priorita prioritize their talent issues. And as a result, what we can present for you today is the high level findings of the views and inputs of about 78 HR leaders across Australia who have been so kind to provide their inputs into a set of questions really honing into how their priorities have shifted uh, before the pandemic towards after the pandemic. As a result, for the first time, we are not only able to share with you a global insights report, but also a localized Australian report. Um, and in addition to that, we've got, I believe, about 23 other reports, either country-specific reports or regional reports from all areas across the world. So very exciting time. Last year, after we conducted this survey, we had over a thousand downloads on our website of the global report. So hoping that this year, given we are now having a localized version of it as well, that we will do even better than then. Just by way of managing um, expectations a little bit, we are not able to ask or answer any questions at this point in time. But as I mentioned, it's very much a high level whistleblower, if you like, a little bit of a teaser to alert you to the fact that the report has now launched. But we are planning on conducting some deep dive sessions over the next couple of months where we will definitely be able to interact with you all in much more detail, answer any questions and also really present the how of what this data is actually telling us, leveraging some insights from a number of clients um, who might want to provide their input. All right, so how has this world really um, been different? Um, and no one would deny that the world we're stepping into in the at the start of 2021 really is very different to how we started 2020 last year for a variety of reasons. I mean, we've obviously seen uh, economic challenges, we've seen health challenges as a result of COVID-19 um, that have taken a bit of a local um, sort of turn in Australia with interstate borders, international borders closing, uh, devastating impacts of, on the economy and really a push for organizations to start implementing at an accelerated manner, um, digital working practices, new business models, new ways of working and really asking them to have a very strong um, focus on initiatives all to do with the health and the well-being of their employees um, and supporting leaders to lead virtual teams. And that all in the context of leaders starting to really understand the risk landscape within which they're operating um, and really come to terms with the fact that um, the focus is really on making sure that they are ready uh, if and when another downturn or another crisis like we've just experienced occurs, which has given rise to really that whole concept again of stakeholder capitalism, knowing that leaders can't solve for these problems on their own and really need to leverage that wider stakeholder group um, that, that their organization is part of. So really the key here is that Whilst it has been a very challenging time for all of us and for organizational, organizations alike across the world, all with complex issues, challenges, political agendas, um, um, local, uh, local issues that came about, 
what we can say though, that whilst there has been a challenge, it's also been a time for opportunity and learning. And it is now a matter of understanding all those innovations that have come about as a result of necessity, if you like, what can we learn from them? And what do we want to take into the future into this year's focus? And before we do that, we'd like to ask um, you as an audience around what is it for you in your organization that has shifted focus? How are you now reprioritizing what you were planning on doing given the year that we've gone through? And here's a list of about five options um, and really keen to hear how some of your views or your priorities may have shifted as we move into 2021. What well, no surprise is there, what we're seeing here is um, as a number one, obviously a lot of you are thinking of uh, future workforce needs and restructuring, redefining what that looks like. Um, and as a, um, a, as a second, that piece around upskilling and reskilling as a priority. Um, and we are going to talk in a lot more detail about that, not only today, but also as we are going into the deep dive sessions um, over the next coming months. So if we're taking a step back, back in 2020, so prior to the pandemic, um, we actually went out, as I said, to a number of board members, executives, HR leaders um, across many different geographies and really asked them, if there was ever a downturn, where would you focus your attention? And their focus very much went to exactly that piece around the future of work and the new ways of working, around strengthening their strategic partnerships, but also much more around applying those um, variable staffing models, making use of a much wider talent ecosystem. And as part of that, also really honing in on automation, artificial intelligence, and what is still going to be done by, by, by human labor, if you like. But the key point there being that executive leaders were very much aware that an economic downturn was not going to, con to stop their focus on these areas. In fact, they understood that that piece around the whole accelerated future of work implementation is not only there by way of a competitive uh, advantage against their competitors, but is very much a necessity for their organization to remain relevant. Um, and as a result, it won't come as a surprise that they continue to be the areas that we see organizations focusing on. Um, the audience said earlier that what you are focusing on is restructuring uh, as the number one, and we see that very much reflected um, as well. In fact, in Australia, um, we, we see 66% of the organizations focusing on this, which is quite a bit above the 45% um, global average. Um, followed by, secondly, the whole flexibility piece, which can always, almost, almost be uh, redetermined as flexibility on steroids, given the accelerated manner in which organizations had to sort of rethink that whole piece, followed by a culture of caring and well-being. And that sort of brings us really to the four talent trends of this conversation. Focus on future, race to reskill, sense with science, and energizing the experience. Now, for those of you that have been reading our Global Talent Trends reports, you will recognize these trends because in many ways they have really remained relevant as we are moving out of the pandemic and into the future. But what has definitely changed is the speed at which organizations are starting to implement some of these trends and the focus that they are putting on these as they are trying to really rebuild uh, and set themselves up for success in 2021. With that, we're starting on the first um, trend, which is focus on futures. Now, as you may recall from last year, focus on future is really a trend that really talks about um, how it is our responsibilities as humans to really um, make sure that we build sustainable future for us all, not only for us as individuals, but also equally importantly uh, for organizations um, and the like. And, the reasons for this trend having such an accelerated focus this year is not um, is totally understandable because so many things have happened. Think about in Australia, the bushfires having catastrophic effects on climate and really um, putting the focus again on the need to, um, to look at climate change. But then the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a whole set of racial and, and gender diversity issues with, with females really being pulled back out of the workforce as a result of school closures, 
We've seen the Black Lives Matters movement, which is really focused in on, um, on racial inequality as a, as a result of the pandemic. And then lastly, of course, the whole employee experience piece alike, where organizations have understood the need to really focus much more on the overall well-being of their employees, both from a health perspective as well as from a financial perspective. At a very high level, what does that mean? Um, and one of the ways in which organizations are really starting to build that sustainable future for everyone is to leverage that stakeholder capitalism much more than they have done so in the past. Um, it's, so it's about redefining their purpose, not only to give back to their shareholders, but to really understand and hone in on the challenges and the needs of their customers, of their suppliers, of the wider community, but first and foremost, also on their internal employees. Um, and great to see that we've got 70% of uh, HR leaders who have provided us with the information that they're either retaining focus or even enhancing focus on that whole multi-stakeholder um, or stakeholder capitalism approach. And they're doing that in a number of different ways by really, as I said, redefining the purpose, but more importantly, making sure that that redefined purpose of what that shared future looks like, that that can, gets cascaded throughout the culture of the organization and then get, is being kept in check by building into executive scorecards, putting measures in place, metrics in place to make sure that tangible, um, tangible pro progress is being made. The concept of the stakeholder capitalism means that organizations don't only think about that from an external lens, whereby they're thinking about giving back to their shareholders, but they're also thinking much more about what it means internally and how they can make sure that they really present a talent value proposition that their employees can really align to and feel strongly purposely aligned to. Prior to the pandemic back in 2020, we actually asked um, a number of, uh, of potential employees, what is it that you're looking for in an organization? What attracts you to your organization? And 51% of them said it's really the physical, psychological and financial well-being that an organization provides that would really make me want to go and work there. Followed by a number of close seconds, responsible rewards, the whole ESG piece, and then that sense of, of broader purpose around sustainability. So again, those things have not changed. In fact, the pandemic has only amplified them as something for organizations to really strongly focus on. And so here is a list on the right hand side of the slide of what organizations are doing to really tap much more strongly into how they can respond to the expectation of employee experience of a clear talent value proposition that looks first and foremost to the welfare of their internal employees. With that, I will hand over to Kate, who's going to touch on the um, second trend of race to reskill. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kat. And uh, really interesting to see our poll results at the beginning of the webinar. Um, super relevant to this second trend that I'll briefly talk about, um, defining future workforce needs and upskilling and reskilling and making that a priority because what we know is transformation is, is really high on the executive agenda this year. But what's different this year is the speed at which organisations are transforming because of the cutthroat climate of COVID-19 and the squeeze on budgets and spending. And when we asked HR leaders this year about the financial impact of the pandemic on their business, we heard that nearly half of organisations that responded are seeing year-on-year -year revenue declines of 10% or more. What's interesting is that pre-pandemic, um, we heard that ex Australian executives believed that 40% of their workforces could adapt to the new world of work. So they didn't have a huge amount of confidence in employees here and in being able to rapidly um, adapt and change their ways of working to um, disruption in the future. Um, but at the same time last year, 78% of employees said they're ready to reskill. And what the events of 2020 have shown is that employees here and all over the world are demonstrating their ability to adapt and transform. And at the heart of this transformation is the race to reskill. And in our survey, um, 2020 survey before the pandemic, a staggering 98% of companies 
said that they were going to embark on significant transformation um, in the following year. And what we did this year when we went back out to HR leaders and said, given what's happened in 2020, how have those transformation plans changed? So given the experience of remote working and the need for organizations to adjust capacity swiftly according to demand, it's not surprising that 59% of Australian companies told us their focus was on reinventing flexibility beyond just when and where people work to think around what work is done, how it's done and by whom. Then we heard over half of organisations here will be targeting reskilling towards their critical talent pools and nearly half will undertake significant workforce transformation in 2021, which is substantially higher than the global average of 27%, so higher on the agenda here than a lot of places across the world. Before the pandemic, companies reported that the primary challenge to successful organisational transformation was not having the right skill set to execute. But today they're telling us that employee exhaustion, multiple priorities and lack of budgets are bigger barriers than workforce capability and skills, which really paints the picture actually of how significantly things have changed. Um, and it also shows why employee experience, which is a trend I'll talk about a little bit later, um, has risen so much in importance this year as well. And we also asked HR leaders this year, what are the critical skills for future resilience? And they told us their top five, which is shown at the bottom of this slide. They said adaptability, having a growth mindset, collaboration, empathy, digital dexterity, and prioritization were the skills that they thought their workforce needs to respond to future disruption and, and the constantly changing nature of work. So what we see at Mercer is that technical skills are of course valuable and upskilling and reskilling should be a priority for all organizations, but they're not everything. So as we observe a transition to a post COVID economy, what becomes more important than skills themselves are the enduring human capabilities and the ability to learn, apply and effectively adapt to skill requirements. Organisations that nurture and cultivate these human capabilities in their workforce will have a strategic advantage and will be better at adapting to increased disruption and change, which will no doubt be coming in the future. So, what are Australian companies doing to accelerate their reskilling efforts? Um, a really important question that we ask. Firstly, organisations are prioritising identifying which skills and capabilities they'll need for post-COVID operations. Um, we saw that two thirds of organisations here are planning to do this in the coming year. Half of organisations are focusing on gathering information on employees' current skills, um, which is an increase on previous years and, and indicates a wider adoption of skills-based talent strategies to come in the future, we think. Then 43% of organisations are focusing on identifying ways to move and develop talent based on skills. So things like virtual working in terms of collaboration, mentoring, job shadowing will be a focus for many organisations here in, in that massive shift to um, the online world. So the case for skills development and the race to reskill I hope is clear from what we've just talked about and um, looking at working people sort of through a skills lens does enable companies to quickly adapt and respond to future shocks and changes that might be um, on the path for them. And it's going to be a key differentiator in the future. And that's why we're seeing urgency in building flexible work models, in focusing on building digital, but also human capabilities, mm -hmm. Um, and why we're also seeing organisations scrambling to understand what skills they have, what skills they need and how best to develop them. And what this means is that organisations will also need to really think about how they recognise and reward skills. And, you know, potentially this will pave the way for a pay for skills rather than pay for job approach in the future. And now I'll hand over to Ephraim to talk a little bit about how organizations are accelerating their use of data for strategic insights. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, COVID, uh, we talked a lot about COVID, but one thing from a, you know, sensing the science perspective, COVID has exponentially increased the volume, but also the type of 
data and information that organizations are collecting, which, which raises many, many questions about the ethical use of employees' personal data. So we have got the data, we've got the science, but now how do we all use it with sense? That is the key challenge. So what are people leaders uh, and HR leaders um, prioritizing in terms of improvement around people analytics in 2021? It's probably not surprising that strategic workforce planning and modeling is chopping the list here. You know, it's all about resetting operating models, as Kate just mentioned earlier, and getting ready for a, a post-pandemic market reality that requires different, different workforce and skill configurations. We also see performance related to flexible working high on the analytics list. You know, and insights related to learning and skills acquisition uh, have made it into the top three the first time this year. Uh, this is not surprising, again, just reflecting on Kate's comments uh, around the shifts in, in skills and capability. Given almost all learnings are done virtually at the moment, the data about employee engagement with learning has never been greater. Learning analytics ranges from very practical analysis around the use and interaction with online learning content all the way to an understanding of the linkage between people's learning patterns and how it really relates to job performance, to well-being, and the individual and to individual growth, but also organizational growth. You, you, you also see that analytics in the areas of pay equity, psychological, mental, and, and physical well-being are increasing in importance. And that's oh, that's not a surprise. We have about 40% of HR leaders here in Australia seeing that as a focus for them in 2021. Yet faced with that almost like trilogy of new data and at the same time sometimes old mindsets and very much dis distributed and embedded decision making the risk is that companies might fail in their duty of care. So last year we heard from employees that they are waking up to the data security concern. And this year, this has been very loud and clear um, in the feedback we've got from the HR leader community. 65% are concerned about data security and cyber risk, especially to personal, I mean, the personal and um, personal identifiable information. So the question is really, would you be comfortable as an organization with your local newspaper to report on your experiments and your use of, use of data. So that's, I guess that's the guiding question for HR leaders and executives. So what does that mean um, in terms of specific activities during COVID? 90, uh, sorry, 29% of organizations who advise their data governance guidelines and about, and this is all about who has access to sensitive data, but also what type of analysis should we and do we conduct and for what purpose to be very clear around who has access and the purpose of the analysis. And 41% use enhanced employee listening to monitor and assess the impact of leadership communication on employee well-being and engagement. So what are leading companies doing this year specifically? They are really ensuring um, that analytics teams are as closely connected to the business as possible. And they draw on multidiscipline expertise, Kate, if we build that slide. And then they also, they de-risk the potential loss of analytics capabilities and skills because they are still high demand skills all across data engineering, data science and, 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 and storytelling. And leading organizations are also radically reviewing and updating their policies and practices around the ethical use of, of data. So what we'd like to close out these trends with you around, with, a, with a brief snapshot. Um, and we've got four categories here for you, four categories for organizations that are on uh, data analytics and insights journey. Category one is the legouts. They're struggling to really gain momentum and get the buy-in for investment in analytics, both within the HR community, but also across the business. 
The second category is we would call the eager beavers. They, they're really excited about it. They see the potential. They know that um, uh, you know, data and AI-enabled business models are the future. They have invested in cloud technology. They hire data scientists. They have visualization technology. They do a lot of fancy stuff, but they, they come to the realization that this is not quite sustainable. It's often one-off deep dives that, that can't be scaled and, and made sustainable. And then there's the third category that we would call the enlightened category. So they have made good inroads. They have a very clearly articulated data analytics and insights roadmap. They know exactly what they will need to focus on as a business. What is the steady wins the race kind of activity? Um, they, they, they're not focusing so much on the shiny things but really honing in what is needed for business decision making. At the same time, they're also really good with experimentation. They have those little samples, like 10, 10 to 20% of their analytics capacities around experimentation. In COVID, I mean, it was like, for analytics people, it's like a kid in a candy shop. And they're really good with that. They're also really good in decluttering. Um, you know, every new metric and insights needs to replace a metric that's no longer useful. And then the fourth categories are the dissolution. Those are organizations that had efforts in that area before and they might have failed, they might have had multiple efforts and they just couldn't get it off the ground. They are kind of disillusioned and trying to, to think what that means for them moving forward. We'd love to hear from you where your organization is, which category might best applies to that. Just give you a minute. Wow, that's that's really interesting to see that poll coming through. That uh, over fifty percent here in the audience would still identify as laggards. Um, with quite a few eager beavers, and, and some are in the enlightened category. That's that's encouraging to hear. We do see more and more organisations are definitely moving towards a more enlightened approach to data analytics and insights. It's definitely. Yeah, especially here in Australia, we, we could see some quantum leaps in our, in our data as well over the last couple of months and years. Um, with that, Kate, I'll hand it back to you to bring home what that means for the employee experience. Thanks, Ephraim, and, and so true. I mean, the amount of data available now is, is somewhat overwhelming and, and, you know, there's a lot more that organizations here can do to really hire the power of that data and and one of those you know really key uses of data is to understand the employee experience and that's where data can really provide insight and and help us make you know really great decisions that can influence our employees and I I feel like probably everyone on this webinar this morning would agree that their employee experience last year changed dramatically. I, I can't imagine there would any, be anyone where their work remained exactly the same um, as it did pre-pandemic and, and pre-2020. Uh, um, you know, we had vast numbers of employees working at home in isolation or had to face the challenge of working on site in a COVID safe way. We had people with reduced hours or those that were furloughed. And for those working at home, um, the line between work and home life was fainter than ever. Um, and the impact on business and, and their people is clear. So employees are reporting increased psychological symptoms, including anxiety and depression, um, that they attribute to the COVID-19 restrictions and the impact, you know, significant impact of COVID-19 and the experiences on their, their work and personal lives. And as I mentioned before, HR leaders in Australia identified employee exhaustion as their key barrier to transformation. So it's a really key thing to address, you know, the employee experience and how can we really energize that and, and make sure you know, everyone has what they need to come to work at their best. So we asked HR leaders this year about the, this change in employee experience and heard that over 90% of Australian HR leaders um, saw a dramatic change in how we work flexibly, um, which means, as Kat mentioned before, they've seen an overnight need for flexibility on steroids. And 71% are seeing an impact on how we manage employees. 
hiring and onboarding have also changed significantly for many organizations in Australia, as has the way they go about building teams and culture. So you know, really huge shifts um, of the speed and magnitude that we've not before seen, I think. So the immediate priority for HR is to create this flexibility on steroids for employees long term, you know, make this flexibility permanent in a way that works for both employees and the organization. Um, and taking this a step further, HR needs to combine well curated experiences with a strong sense of psychological connection to a workplace, whatever that might mean now, um, and with a sense of transformation and growth and learning, all without making employees feel too overwhelmed, which is a significant challenge for our colleagues on the call indeed. And HR transformation, the transformation of the function itself has been on pause for um, a while whilst companies remain in respond mode. But we really see that digitalization and operating model agility will have to be a focus um, in the coming year and years as well as HR really needs to rise to the challenge of the new world of work. So that concludes our whistle stop tour of the four trends this year. And I'll, I'll hand back to Kat, who's got one final question for our guests on the webinar this morning. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, and as we said earlier, there will be an opportunity for you to join one of the next set of seminar webinars, rather. Um, the next one looking like it will be just prior to Easter, so somewhere in April, where we are going to provide a much more deeper dive into some of the trends we've discussed today and really um, explain a lot more around how some of these trends actually come to life within an organization. Um, so today was really all about getting you hopefully a little bit excited about more to come. Um, but we really want to make sure that we provide you with the um, insights and responses that are most top of mind for you. So as we're coming to the end of the webinar today, um, I would really like you to take just a couple of seconds to read through the list um, and to let us know what is it that you would like to hear more about. So we will then absolutely take that into account to really build out that next set of webinars that we're going to conduct over the next couple of months. So if you wouldn't mind just having a look, um, it's all obviously related to the trends we've talked about today and let us know what's top of mind for you. Thank you so much. Interesting, we weren't necessarily expecting that employee experience is gonna to top the list, but I'm very happy to hear and we will certainly take that into account. Um, and I'm seeing here, of course, that whole talent analytics piece and the skills-based talent practices um, are both very close seconds. So we will make sure that we spend ample of time uh, on those as well. Um, as we're coming just uh, at the end of the half hour that we have together today, um, I just want to thank both Efraim and Kate for joining um, the panel today. But more importantly, I want to thank you all for, for joining us for the last half hour. I hope you got just enough appetite for what we're doing here to want to join us in the next sessions. And have a wonderful day. We will send you tomorrow an email with the links for the downloads of the report. So you will be able to download both the global report as well as our special Australian specific report. And of course, if you do have any questions um, and, and you can't wait until our next session, by all means, feel free to reach out to us at any given time. And we're very happy to revert back um, and get in touch with you. So thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. See you soon.